In the early morning hours of May 29, 1914, a dense fog enveloped the upper St. Lawrence, blinding two ships heading in opposite directions. The Canadian Pacific Ocean Liner, Empress of Ireland, and the Norwegian Collier Storstad. A nightmarish collision ensued, with the Storstad inflicting a fatal wound to the 550-foot-long ocean liner. The Empress of Ireland sank in less than 15 minutes, taking with her over a thousand passengers and crew members. The disaster rivaled the Titanic sinking just two years before. Yet, the Empress of Ireland, unlike the illustrious Titanic, slipped into obscurity as surely as she slipped beneath the icy waters of the St. Lawrence. Fifty years later, along with the advent of modern scuba equipment, inspired a small group of divers from Montreal to search for the forgotten Empress. Successfully locating the ship, the group reached out to his brother divers to the south. A Canadian-American team was formed to explore the Empress of Ireland. One of them, a woman. In 1968, Ronnie Gilligan set out from Syracuse, New York on a quest for adventure that would turn into a three-year odyssey. Now nearly 40 years since her last dive on the Empress, Ronnie has a renewed interest in her past adventures, vowing to return to the Empress. My book is not only a history book uh, about the, the Empress of Ireland, but also it's an adventure story about diving uh, the Empress of Ireland. And in the course of my uh, research, I came across uh, Ronnie's name and pieced together a, a pretty great story about what they did and what they did was really amazing. Uh, back in 1968, the diver wreck that is as dangerous and challenging as it is, and they were doing it with just rudimentary skills and uh, basic diving equipment. Um, so they were really pushing the envelope uh, of, a, of, a, of a sport. Well, I grew up in the ocean. I, I love Long Beach, Long Island, and that's where I learned to swim. And I took a lot of uh, Red Cross courses, etc. And when I went to Syracuse as a specialist in blind rehabilitation, I also volunteered at the Jewish Community Center. And they came in with a free course for scuba for anyone who was on their staff. So I said, yeah, that sounds great because it has to do with water. I love water. So I took the course and I joined Syracuse Scuba Society and did a lot of diving. The, um, our club was very active. We'd go up to the St. Lawrence probably almost every Friday night and then come home Sunday night or Monday morning. And in the late 60s, uh, one of the guys I dove a lot with, who was an engineer, Pete Perot, got onto this fellow, Andre Menard, who had, it turns out, had kind of rediscovered the Empress in the early 60s and wanted experienced divers to dive because he had had a group that had dove with him two years prior, but they, they didn't penetrate the ship, they, they just kind of swam around. And he laughingly called them the ship of fools. Andre Menard would enlist the help of Syracuse diver Pete Perot, who then convinced two of his dive buddies to join him on this venture. So off we went. <laughs> we also signed on Fred Zeller. So he had three Americans, Andre Menard and Bergeron, whose boat we were using. It took us like four days to find the Empress because Andre didn't have um, Lawrence or any kind of uh, pictures. All he had was this thing that he held under his nose and he looked under his nose and he, he kept trying to line up a church, a road, and a field for four days. Finally, we did snag it, and um, then we began diving the Empress of Ireland. Okay, on the first dive, after we did find the ship, Pete and I suited up, and before I even got in the water, I, I was 
drunk. I was narked. I was so excited. And so that euphoria continued as I went down the line. And I think that that's really the only time I can really say that I know that I was snarked. Um, but I saw this huge ship coming into view, just a dark outline. Everything was dark, but I could see the outline. And on it were growing things that looked like tulips, lots of white tulip bulby things. And I was just very peaceful and very happy. So off we went. So we had our first dive on the Empress and we came back and yes it was. One of the things that made a big difference that day too is that I took my lucky um, gray elephant, my lucky gray inflatable elephant, and I told them we'd find them that day and we did so. The equipment that we were all using back then was top of the line. We had gone out and we even bought ourselves uh, what Pete used to call the bendomatic. It uh, was a thing that you wore on your arm and it told you how deep you had been and how much um, nitrogen you had. And it was a little red line and if it was in the red, you had to stay under it. We dove with double 72s. We also had a pony tank uh, rigged between the doubles. Um, for emergency, so we were diving with two, two regulators. We were diving in wetsuits. They were um, quarter inch, but we had many layers. Andre Menard uh, did not follow dive tables. Um, he just kind of arrived and left dives when he felt like. Um, he also had a um, the first dry suit, maybe in creation, but the first one I had ever seen. We had Gilligan's douche bag, which is a, a huge, I, I don't know what else to call it because that's all anyone ever called it. Um, but it was a big BF Goodrich, huge inflatable rubber monster that, uh, that we were going to use for heavy lifting. As it turned out, we never used it for anything. Over the course of three years, the team would make over a hundred dives exploring this forgotten relic. Menard, Gilligan, and her fellow divers from the Syracuse Scuba Society blazed a bold trail in wreck diving, and in the process, set an example that still awes divers to this day. The adventure and stuff was just fantastic. Well, in the, in the course of interviewing her, I, I asked her if she would be interested in returning, you know, rhetorically. I never really thought that she would seriously consider it, and she said, no, I don't think so. But I think over time, that thought gestated, and uh, she said, you know, maybe I have it in me. And he said that they were going up, they, he and his team, were going up to dive the Empress of Ireland in August. And he said, would you like to come? <laughs> and I said, no. Thank you very much, no. I kept thinking of that question, would I like to dive the Empress of Ireland again? Hmm, no. No. Hmm, maybe. And I decided, yeah, I, I could probably do that. Trying to recapture my dive of, of going across the bow and seeing it in perfect visibility. Uh, the one time that that happened.
at first I talked to Miss Gilligan and I, I looked at the type of equipment she did and, and the type of dives they did. And with my company, um, we arrange expeditions, extreme expeditions. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take the mandate. If she's got the heart, which she certainly did, um, I'm going to bring up the, the technical side of it. Um, so originally we arranged a series of training um, exercises in the, in the Thousand Islands, which is, is warm, clear water. And we kind of fast forwarded the clock uh, 30 years. Ronnie would train with Kulisex to prepare for her eventual reunion with the Empress. Wetsuits like those used by Ronnie and her dive buddies in the 60s are no longer available. Ronnie is fitted with and trained in a dry suit that would protect her from the frigid waters of the St. Lawrence. Winds are light, making for calm seas, conditions the team have been waiting for. In the immortal words of the late treasure hunter Mel Fisher, today's the day. The team heads out. After a short ride on the slick surface of the river, they arrive at the Bell Buoy, marking the site where the remains of the Empress of Ireland will spend eternity. Our dive vessel is secure to the mooring and it's time to suit up. Safety divers enter the water to make certain everything is ready to go. In a dry suit, Ronnie familiarizes herself with the new equipment. William Allen will be Ronnie's dive buddy. Appropriately, he has been working with Ronnie especially for this dive. Will and Ronnie discuss the problem of inversion, something she experienced in her training. Inversion is when the air in a dry suit becomes trapped in the feet. The situation could become dangerous if a diver is unable to correct the problem on their own. Okay, you have another one here you can pull on, but you won't need to. Okay, so you just got to remember that you got the air's got to come up to the top where it can get out. Hold it up high over your shoulder and dump it. If you're head first down, you're not going to be able to get the air out because it's going to be all up here. In that case, if you can't get the other way around, then you can use this. You just pull on that cord. But you should always try this cord out. Remember that. Kulisak double checks that everything is in good working order. Ronnie and Kulisak go over the dive plan one last time. You've got, you, you know, right now with what you're carrying on that rig, is there's sufficient weight compared to what you used in fresh water in the earlier training we did and to compensate for the uh, compensate for the salt. So I don't, I'm pretty sure there'll be no problem with the weight. If there is, at the last minute we can load on, Put on a, a little bit right off the back. So there's not, that's not, I don't think that's going to be a concern. You know, the thing is, and, and please, please, the minute you start to get cold, tell Will. Okay, and he'll start coming back. It won't end the dive. But, right. You know the thing is, as you know, is the, it's a snowballing effect. A little what bit. What am I breathing? Pardon? What's propane? You strike a match, and it'll really it'll keep you nice and warm. No, that's uh, it's straight air. So I'm gonna give you this guy here. You're gonna have this. Once you go in the water, I'll pull on this. I'll right you and pull you toward the boat. Once you're on the boat, then you can grab this this tagline which will take you out 
straight to the, the mooring line. It'll connect to the mooring line at about six feet of water. Ronnie waits patiently as Will dons his gear and flips into the water. A few last minute adjustments and it's time to splash. Stabilize. No, 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 don't. Okay, make sure you're holding your mask. Okay, yes. Two seconds. Two seconds. Putting some air in the wings so that you float. That's. Okay, go ahead and hang on to the rope still, deflate your wings. Right here. Okay, leave your head floating on the surface still. Grab onto this one. in your mouth. That's a girl. Good luck. Ronnie makes it to the wreck, but the problem she had experienced in training emerges. The dive is quickly aborted. All right, hey guys. Get a blanket. Get a blanket. I think she's a little hypothermic. Hypothermic, or do you have any other problems? Suit's flooded. Suit's flooded. Okay. Uh, you want a line to attach the off. gear to? Me? Take it off in the water, or do you want to pick it up? Let's do it. Let go. Okay. Good. You guys can seal off, all right? Take this thing off. You okay? Okay. Ronnie is cold but unscathed, her experience a bittersweet triumph. Not at all what she had perceived it would be. Later, Ronnie would feel less indignant when reporter John Grant for CTV, a national Canadian television broadcasting company, would ask her for a story. The piece would be aired that night and be replayed several times over the next few weeks. Ronnie had indeed made her return to the Empress. ...collided with another ship on the St. Lawrence River. She sank in just 14 minutes, taking more than a thousand people down with her. The wreckage has become a popular site for divers, but this week, one of her first visitors came back for an emotional reunion. John Grant reports. Veronica Gilligan first came here in 1968. She was part of the first group of civilian divers to enter the wreck. And I'm like, whoa, this is like the day kind of like God created the world. And it was like really 
quiet and beautiful and I knew I was going to die. <laughs> and it was like kind of okay. I was very calm, but it was beautiful and I was on the Empress. 35 years ago, the wreck was relatively unknown and untouched. The ship went down so fast, there was no time even to launch this lifeboat. Gilligan and her colleagues spent three summers diving and searching. At the end of the second year, they found a safe, and when they opened it... So we had tickets for a ferry ride to Brackenhead. We got a McClure's magazine from April 1914, and uh, that was it. And we even threw the strong backs back in. It, it had holes and it was old, so we threw a lot of stuff back in the water. I mean, now people would kill for it, or at least pay a lot of money for it. Gilligan was invited back to the wreck by Kevin McMurray, who was writing a book about the Empress. This, of course, thrilled the prospect of uh, reuniting Ronnie with the Empress of Ireland because I thought it would make a, an emotional and fitting end uh, to my book. But she wasn't sure. I hesitated because of my age and, and the fact that I haven't, I know that the Empress takes um, well honed diving skills and I haven't been doing that kind of diving at all. The dive itself wasn't easy. What happened is I kind of got upside down, which unfortunately the photographer didn't come by because when you're upside down, your face goes back to when it was 40 years ago would have been a great shot. And returning to the wreck brought back memories. This time it was also um, difficult because my, I, my dive buddy Pete died a couple of years ago and another friend of mine who dove on it, um, his ashes are scattered on it. So it was an emotional, um, emotional from that point, as well as pushing myself, pushing my own envelope. Because of bad weather, she got just one chance. You sound like you can leave here saying that you did it. Yes. Within certain parameters, but yes, I did it. Happy? Yes. Do it again? I didn't think I was doing this one. <laughs> Probably not. Probably. Although, I would like to see the battle. John Grant, CFCF News, St. Luce.